thank you very much for joining this webinar on leading excellent inclusion and understanding the SEND and alternative provision green paper. I'm Toby Salt, I'm your chair or host for the day and I've got a fantastic panel to help you. A tiny bit about me, I won't do the full positive history. Teacher, head teacher, then a CEO of Academy Trust, National, uh, Deputy Chief Executive of the National College of School Leadership, and then CEO of AQA, the exam board. But what some of the panel know, and some of you will know, is that really I'm an SEND teacher and head teacher. That's my roots. Uh, and in 2010, um, just before the change of government, funnily enough, bad timing, I wrote a review for the Secretary of State on the state of SEND and the need for better training and teachers and supply and money. So it's a very timely time for us to be discussing SEND. I'm delighted that you're all here and I want to um, tell you that there will be questions which you can answer all the way through and put your questions in the, the Q&A on the side, but we'll save the questions till after the panelists discussion at the end. So let me introduce the panelists. I'm going to ask them to say a little bit about themselves so you don't have just one voice and then I'll come back to me and then we'll start with the first speaker. Okay, so if we could start with you, Alison. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Alison Willett. I'm the Education Director for NASEN. NASEN is the National Association for Special Educational Needs. And my background is in teaching for a long, long time and also in SEN support um, teaching, which I've done for a local authority for a long time before coming to NASEN. And I'm delighted to be able to talk on inclusion today. Thanks, Toby. Um, Tracy, yeah, thanks. if you each just do it, that would be lovely. Yeah, thanks, Toby. I'm Tracy Coulters Pittman. So I'm the chief exec of uh, a charity called Beyond Autism, and we'll talk a bit about uh, about that later. My background, um, as, as a, there's a theme emerging, um, so uh, SEN teaching, uh, head teacher, um, and um, Latterly, I've opened a free school and also uh, I used to work for the charity Scope and uh, managed a lot of their services um, at that time. Uh, um, I look forward to filling you in more later. Graham. Oh, hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, morning, guys. Um, my name is Graham Quinn. I'm uh, the CEO of Newbridge Multi Academy Trust based in um, Oldham, Thameside and Rochdale in the northwest of, of England. Um, I'm also on the uh, SEND National Reference Group. Um, I'm chair of Special Schools Voice and um, I'm SSAT's National Ambassador. Uh, really looking forward to this morning's sessions. So um, can't wait, really. Lucy. Hi everybody, I'm Lucy and I'm CEO of Head Teach Chat, a little bit like everybody else really. I've been everything in school from um, reception teacher to year six teacher, uh, to SENCO, to inclusion lead for two schools, to acting head, deputy head, you name it, I've been there. Um, and I'm now working for my own company with my husband Jonathan and we run Head Teach Chat. So that's lovely. And thank you to the panel. And thank you very much for giving up your time. And thank you also, if I got to say at the beginning, to all of those of you who are actually watching this um, either live or afterwards. Lots of people watch it later on and recording. Thank you so much for doing that. And um, behind the scenes here at the moment, if you're watching live, is Zara. If you have any technical issues, just put them in the chat and she will pick them up and deal with them because I wouldn't have a clue. Um, so this is the right time. And it's the right time for a review of SEN. And I'm delighted the government done it. If you talk to Nadim or his special advisors, they would be keen to point out to you that this comes as a trio. The white paper, now the education bill, the green paper on SEN D, and the review of children's services, because there is a sandwich and a trio. And actually, those of you that work with SEN know that actually is never more important for those three things to tie together. But it is an important time. 15.8% of our English school population have SENs, of which that's 1.4 million children. Of those, 12.2% get support. And at the moment, 37 have an EHCP. And that number has increasingly gone up year after year after year. And I don't need to tell any of you, particularly not the panel, the level of complexity 
and the needs of those youngsters has also accelerated year on year. So the system is under stress. There's no secret that some parents are unhappy and want more and want, more, want, want support more quickly. At the same time, professionals working in the sector want more training, more support and more resources. And the funding issue is a really serious and really challenging for all parts of the system. So it's a great time for a green paper. And I'm really pleased that Zen are allowing us to look at it in a bit more detail through the eyes of practitioners and through the eyes of those who are looking at the implications of it. And that will give some of you the opportunity and hopefully the confidence to then respond to the green paper. Green paper means that it's there for consultation. You know, we could be cynical, um, but I can give you examples of where government green papers have changed uh, when they've gone through to white paper and through to education bill. So it's an opportunity to influence that and to highlight it. So without any more ado, I want to go to our first speaker. So the way this is going to work is each speaker is going to speak for just under 10 minutes. And at the end, we'll come together and you have the opportunity to ask questions to the panel. And I'll chair those and put them in there. So don't be shy, put your questions in there um, so I can see them and actually respond to them. Or um, you can put questions afterwards if you want to and we'll try and respond to them. We probably won't get all of the questions. And if you're a bit shy and we don't get lots, I've got a few questions that have come in beforehand from people as well. So if we start now, we'll go over to our first speaker. Um, and thank you very much. Alison, you're first. I'm putting on warning, Tracy, you're next. Thanks, Alison. Brilliant. Thanks, Toby. I've already introduced myself. So next, please. I'd like to be able to tell you a little bit about NASEN. So NASEN, the National Association for Special Educational Needs, is um, a national charity and we are um, a charity with free membership now. We work predominantly with the school's education workforce, so that's our, um, and that's our cause really to support education um, professionals in their work with children and young people with SEND and learning differences. And we do that by providing um, free and paid for resources and support. We lead targeted programmes and projects to try to um, deliver widespread improvement. And we provide a structured programme of professional development. Um, you can see CPDL there, Continuing Professional Development and Learning. That's a key part of what we offer to the workforce. Um, so please do have a look at our website and come and join us as a free member. It's a perfect opportunity here today for me to be able to share that with you. Nason also hosts, next please, the Whole School Send Consortium, which is, as you can see on the slide, um, and a massive um, consortium group of people who are really committed, organisations who are committed to inclusion. Um, and last year we delivered the Department for Education's SEND Schools Workforce Development Contract, which has been incredibly powerful actually in bringing lots of schools through lots of different strands of CPD activity together for SEND. And we've seen some tangible outcomes as well with 93% of participants committing to incorporating their learning from that CPD into their practice. And we've had examples like more inclusive policies as a result being created, some earlier intervention. And actually already we've had some impact reported, which we know is very difficult to link directly through. But we've had qualitative feedback, such as a reduction in the use of restraint in some schools and also feedback showing reduced stress for children because their voice is being heard better. So again, just to join the community, the member community of Whole School Send, click into free membership for NASEN and check the box that just says, um, I'd like to receive the newsletter. Thank you, next please. So the first of the two questions that I was asked to say something about today here was what's important for those working with children with SEN from the green paper. And perhaps for me, the main messages coming through for schools are about consistency and better provision. So consistency, a bit of standardization across the country, particularly to be achieved through some statutory national standards. And that's to bring greater confidence to parents and carers and to make sure that provision meets the needs um, of children in the same way everywhere. Better provision, particularly at the universal level um, with higher aspirations, clearer accountabilities, and hopefully a removal of the kind of postcode lottery issues that we've had. There are lots of proposals and, um, and Zen Educate has produced a really useful summary document, which has got some at a glance groupings of those. But for my 10 minutes here with you today, the focus is on what's important for those working with children and young people. So for some of the mainstream teachers, some of the main takeaways are on the slide here. That suite of consistent standards. So processes for decision making on how needs are identified and met, how they're recorded, how and when an assessment should happen. 
um, and, and who should be involved in that, how and when um, SEN support is actually required and what best practice looks like in reasonable adjustments for disabled children, which should be quite interesting. I think the third bullet point is key here, expectations, that idea that there'll be um, prescribed ordinarily available provision, presumably at the universal level in particular, what mainstream provision should look like. Some clarity on the circumstances for an education, health and care plan, and whether those needs actually require a specialist setting. And really interestingly, moving us forward from where we are in the current code of practice and legislation, actual consistent standards on co-production and communication with children, young people and their parents and carers. And also some consistently deliverable arrangements for transition between phases and also between education and employment. In addition to those national standards, some of the key things that I thought were really interesting to pull out included um, the proposal to look at standardised and digital education health care plans. And that kind of acknowledges the ongoing difficulties um, that people have had in navigating the system, particularly where we've got regional variation in, um, in plan formats and where children and, and parents are moving between um, schools in different areas, making it quite difficult to share. And certainly for SENCOs and schools as well, where they've got children from lots of different local authorities. So one of the proposals there is that the um, digitised template will also help with parents and carers having a little bit more control because it's proposed that no changes can be made um, without parental input. It should make sure that everybody can access the, um, the plan more easily and also make it more personalised because it gives the opportunity to include photo and video, which is really nice. There's mention of tiered support packages from alternative provision settings, which sounds like a really good opportunity um, to look at behavioural needs in particular and a positive step really to spreading the expertise across the system towards a stronger continuum of support and provision for children and young people. And it's clearer on the intention for, uh, for alternative provision to be part of a child's educational journey rather than a destination. And it's also great to see that there might be um, some new research on classroom based practice for SEND to add to that collective understanding really of what works. The next question, next please, that I was asked to think about today was what advice would you give to a school leader who wants to establish an effective inclusive school but has a limited budget, where would you spend it? Gosh, big question. I've tried to be a bit pragmatic really and I've also dodged it slightly because I've gone for establish some starting points and then develop some good strategy that links from those. So I think a, a large proportion of what's required to become more inclusive is often about shifting mindsets, changing perceptions and making a commitment to making that positive change collectively as a staff, community, the school, children, young people, pulling everybody together. And that is not to minimise the challenges that Toby's already referred to there in funding, because particularly for the children with complex needs at the edges of education healthcare plans, where support might be needed, those are, those are very real challenges for schools that we recognise. The starting points, know your staff, know your pupils, um, know their skills, the staff skills, the confidence, their level of knowledge of SCN, but the pupils, the profile in your school, audit, your current level of inclusivity. And there are lots of free tools to help with that. And I've put one on the screen there, the Send Review Guide, which is um, DfE funded, so it's free to access from Whole School Send and the website's there. It just helps you to audit, look at existing strengths, and find out where there are opportunities to, um, to take pockets of good practice further. And from those starting points, thinking about the strategy, um, once you know a little bit more, you can review your provision against need and then collectively, um, as a school, as a staff, as a community, try to establish that sense of a shared understanding about what you mean by inclusion. I think quite a few of the questions come from not having that clarity. What would that vision look like for your school? And then make all the decisions inclusive by design. So distributing responsibility and leadership fully so that everybody's an agent for change and everybody can lead in their own way quite ethically and look at decision-making through that lens. One crucial consideration from beginning to end really is about how you hear from and listen to the ultimate beneficiaries of all your work. So next, next please, the children and young people with SEND and their families. How can you work together? In what ways can you work together? How can you commit to person-centered working? Look to remove the power dynamic um, and serve the community better really through co-production. And it's interesting that that links back to the national standards now that are being proposed. 
And that's really the principle underpinning it all is that shared understanding. What will good look like for us? What will change if we're more inclusive? How will we know we've been successful? Next, please. You cannot possibly look at inclusivity and increasing it, I don't think, without investing in teachers. We know that teachers make the biggest difference as an in-school factor. And so prioritizing effective CPDL for, uh, for teachers is crucial. So after those starting points, looking at how you can make that universal provision as robust as possible, again, through that, that lens of um, inclusion by design. What I've put on screen there is um, just on that previous one was a handbook for teachers around SEND. Again, that's a whole school send resource. It's brilliant. And if you're interested in inclusive practice, it's good to have a look through there. There's some really good ideas. Um, there's also other um, tools to help schools, um, staff throughout schools to, to look at their own pathway for CPDL for SEND. And we've got a new tool that's only just been released actually onto the Whole School SEND website, which has been developed just to try to help navigate the many free resources that are out there in the, the CPD. So that SEND development pathway tool that you can see again on the same website, just helps staff to think about what they're interested in learning, where their next steps are and how to find that CPD to suit them. Um, and so I would encourage you to just have a look at that website for all of the kind of resource that you can use to become a little bit more inclusive. And that's that's it, really. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. And if you want to keep talking to me, my email's there. Thanks, David. Alison, that was great. Thank you very much. And we'll kind of come on to Tracy in a minute. Um, and that was really informative, gave a lot of insight. I would say to those of you also who are teaching assistants or other professionals supporting us at the end who are online now the word teachers covers all of you in, and that's certainly the case for Nason um, I, you know the, you can't segment our sector into neat titles sadly um, or probably happily um, Tracy on to you actually you've got a very wide workforce I have thanks Toby um, okay uh, yeah so I've already introduced myself uh, beyond autism this this is our vision uh, and and our mission as a charity um, and saying every child and young adult with autism um, is a huge um, statement to make and I think that um, but we really believe in that and the only way we can do that is through partnerships and through um, really working together sharing good practice sharing our resources and so on and being very mindful of not reinventing the wheel and I think one of the interesting things about the um, SEND review now is a, a kind of undertone somewhere in there for me about how we are all going to go forward rather than just rehash what we've al already had in the past. A kind of sense of what got us here won't get us there and, and how we can be innovative and creative um, all, all together to ensure inclusion in all its, its senses. If we could move to the next slide, that'd be really helpful, thank you. So at Beyond Autism, we'd stated these five kind of strategic objectives um, back in 2020 when we kicked off the current strategic period for our organization. And, and I'm, it's almost like we, we all know, don't we, in this sector, kind of what's needed to be done and what need um, what we all need to be doing together and and these objectives really um, underpin that and they underpin a kind of societal change we want to see and and that's what I'm really hoping that we're going to see through the review um, and when the green paper moves on um, it, into all, all the things that um, they hope it will be um, I guess the implications of um, some of that for so at Beyond Autism we do have two in independent special schools and as independent special schools we sit slightly outside of um, other education provision we're considered as out of county we um, don't sit in a multi-academy trust at the moment that'll be interesting going forward for other specialist provision but a, a huge amount of what's exciting potentially exciting about um, what they're suggesting in the review is the whole local, you know, working together with mainstream and others to to really 
uh, ensure children stay in the right schools, in their local schools and in the right schools for them. Uh, I do still see a place for um, independent specialists in that, and I'm sort of bound to say that, I suppose, but I, I, I think that I do see a place for that um, because there will always be children for whom the general um, education setting um, can't differentiate finely enough to ensure that they get the outcomes that they should be getting. Um, and that doesn't mean that children should always be kind of locked into specialist settings. Um, there could be a revolving door. Um, and I think that's something we really need to think about. And I know that within um, AP provision, that's kind of the idea, but it doesn't really happen currently. And the reasons it doesn't happen is because when you go back from AP into the original school, it, the environment's not right. And I, that really links to some of the stuff that was just spoken about a, a minute ago from Nason, you know, in terms of how, how you become an inclusive um, setting. Um, I'm, I'm, the, the other implications for us really, I think, are um, this whole notion of the local partnerships, working with parents and carers. Um, I, what's always interesting in these reviews for me is things are suggested like they've never been heard of before and you kind of sit and think don't you mm, aren't we already doing that um i think that how involved parents and carers get in that in the assessment of local need and local provision is an interesting one um uh, there will be a huge onus on all of us i think as as professionals and providers to to be really engaging with our, our parents and not just the parents that currently use our services, it's the parents we don't know yet and, uh, and so on. And having that kind of open door policy that ca can we help in the specialist sector um, to keep a child in their local mainstream pr provision and, and how does that work for parents as well so there aren't conflicting ideas and, and, and so on. Um, and, and that links to the local inclusion plan um, that's being suggested, which for um, the independent sector, this whole notion of a tailored list, um, which again, is that another word for a local offer? I'm not sure, but um, the tailored list that, um, that parents will be presented when they're trying to name a provision in the education health care plan, if, if they're at the point where they're having an EHCP, and Toby highlighted at the beginning the very low number of percent that actually carry EHCPs um, within our SEND population across our education sector. Um, but that tailored list, um, how independent specialist provision is working with multi-academy trusts and maintain schools and so on, it's going to be really important so that we're all seen as on the continuum of provision. And if we're able to keep more and more children in their local mainstream, then the specialist provision can really be specialist and can target those children um, that, that need that. Like I say, with the view to what does that mean in terms of their community how and becoming active citizens and so on. Um, I suppose, you know, I, I do wear a hat in both mainstream and specialist whilst we run special schools, we do a lot of work and outreach work. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, a lot of outreach work and so on um, to support children to remain in, in their school and to also upskill. Um, and, and I suspect there's quite a, a lot of overlap it, across the panelists here in the work that we're all doing and, and the, the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, the, the review, I think, is much more explicit about how we're going to cross work or could potentially cross work um, from the specialist sector it, with mainstream and how mainstream will be able to draw on that um, to, to ensure that children are included more effectively. Um, and I suppose from our point of view, we're, we're a, a kind of small to medium sized charity. We really would like to have national impact. So we've got to really see ourselves as working in partnership with others to reach everybody. We can't do it on our own. None of us can do it on our own. Um, and some of the things that I've got written there, like a level two with the fast responder uh, as, as an example, is, um, is an kind of innovative new model 
that we're piloting and have been discussing with um, the DfE through the SEND review that's going on. And, and um, I'd be, I, I don't have time to go into what that pilot's all about, but I'd be really interested to share that with people if they're interested. And that's around how you get a fast 24 hour, within 24 hour response into your school to um, support a child who might be at the point of school placement break term. And then it's the wraparound that happens with that and how the fast responder, you know, creates and works with the network to make sure that everybody is being as inclusive as possible. And then, of course, there, you know, we're showing a kind of level three from a beyond autism point of view is all the specialist provision that, that we provide. But there's no reason why that, like I say, isn't being supportive of children within their, their mainstream local areas uh, as well. So. I think for um, the independent specialist, there's the potential implication of what does trust led mean for us and how do we work with that? Um, or do, you know, and because at the moment there's no, there isn't a vehicle for independence to necessarily be subsumed by mats. Um, though some of us would consider setting up our own mats, but we've got very different financial models. And, you know, so it all becomes quite complicated. And I think those conversations will be really important going forward if we are truly all going to work together to the same outcomes uh, with the same goals for all the children we're talking about. Thanks. Tracy, thank you. That was really interesting. Really interesting. Um, and I've written down a couple of questions, but I will wait and see if other people have them first. If you've got questions, please do put them in the Q&A or in the chat, don't care where you put them, but put your questions in. So we now move on to um, Graham. Graham, over to you. Oh, thanks, Toby. Um, morning, everybody. This feels like the most bizarre speed date. I've got seven minutes to try and talk about our trust and the green paper. Um, I'll, I'll do my jolly best to try and hurtle through. Um, okay, just a little bit about, about um, our schools uh, and our group. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we're based in, in, in East Manchester, in predominantly in Rochdale, Oldham and Tameside. We have uh, seven schools based over 12, 13 sites. Um, we, we have two post-19 organisations. Um, all the young people in all of our schools have an education, health and care plan, um, other than one of the schools where there's a, a tiny percentage who, who attend without. Um, overall, we support about 1,400 young people with, with the whole range of, of, of needs and abilities. Uh, we have about 800 staff. Um, one of our unique selling points as a trust is that we're all we're, we're um, all Apple one-to-one -one provider. So all of our colleagues, um, all of the young people, all, all have iPads, um, and we have a, a, a strong belief in in the transformative energy of, of technology and how it sits within within a 21st century curriculum offer. Um, so um, our schools um, are, as Toby pointed out early on in the introduction, massively, massively overcrowded at this point in time. So one of the key challenges that we are facing, and I'll come on to the timeline in relation to the Green Paper in a second or two, is um, we believe the implementation is likely to take um, three, five or seven years. Um, and, and, and I'll come back to that in a second. But I think there is a here and now issue that none of us should, should forget, that we've got young people in our schools at this point in time requiring and demanding the very, very best education from us all. And we mustn't lose that part of, of, of this energy and the fact that, you know, it's, it's easy to look to the horizon with that and sometimes forget what we're dealing with at this point in time. So I've been asked to sort of cover three key, key questions. First of all, um, how our trust is responding to the green paper. Uh, the possibilities that, that we see within that. So I'll pick that up, pick that first of all. Um, I think as a general point, it's important to, to state that this is a green paper um, and the opportunity to influence is really, really considerable. What we've been delighted with um, around um, the, 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 the way that this has been worked through to this point is, is, is the department listening to key stakeholders. And we believe that they've really listened. And I'm like Toby, I'm very optimistic about the direction of travel. We believe they've listened to some of the key issues. We, we believe that they put them into the green paper. And I think we, we now need to try to influence that direction of travel. And um, what I, what I would, would really welcome colleagues, and I know that we're doing this in our trust, is, is ensuring that that influence isn't just by lots of, lots of middle-aged portly people dressed in suits. 
that actually the young people themselves and the families are key drivers in understanding what their lived experience is. Um, and we, we're looking at, we're, we're obviously we, we, with the work we're doing with Apple, we, we, we're looking at innovative ways of ensuring that the young people's voice is heard in the consultation period. We think that's really, really essential that we do that. But, but I do believe, and I honestly believe these colleagues, that we have a real opportunity to influence. And I do believe that the department is in listening mode. So I think it's a really important time at this point to actually get our position across. Um, elements that we think the green paper is a little bit weak on is I think they're getting slightly muddled up around outcomes. I'm not convinced that, that there's enough emphasis on, on, on destinations and ensuring that, that all of the work that we do in the school-based system leads to high quality outcomes for the young people that we all work with. We all know the statistic, of, and it's not moved for the last 15, 20 years, colleagues, that 6% of the population of youngsters with SEND move into paid employment 15 hours plus or more. That has, that, that has been such a challenge that we've got. I believe that we need to do more work on that, and we will be trying to influence the Green Paper to ensure that that part is, is really there and upfront and central. The idea of destination, the reason that we all do what we do, is to empower our young people and their families so they're able to contribute for the future into our communities. Um, we also, I, I picked this, this issue up around timeline. People are getting a little bit freaked. It, 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 the ambition within the Green Paper is superb. The timelines linked to that, we believe, are considerable. This isn't something that's going to happen in three months. It, it, we're not going to get to, to an implementation intention in three months. We're thinking three, five, seven years as a timeline to try to deal with some of the challenges that I know uh, Alison and Tracy have all already mentioned. So I think we have to bear that in mind. We don't want a quick fix. Want to, quick fix, sorry. We want to do this properly. And, and that leads on to one of the other things that we are trying to influence the idea that, that we've all got day jobs. We're all, we're all challenged by the numbers of children that are coming through the system at this point in time. And as I said, these children deserve our very best opportunity, the best opportunity to learn. We really would welcome the opportunity that government gave us ring fenced time and resource after this period of time to think about and work with and co-construct the solutions. This can't be people in offices working it all out as professionals. We really do believe that we need proper time that's ring fenced for all our stakeholders to really pay, play a leading role in relation to, to moving this ambition forward. OK, I've got one minute left and I've got two other bits that I want to just pick up on. So um, one of the one of the questions was was about um, uh, a choice and, and choice for, for, for young people um, and, and their families, particularly those young people who are on the continuum. Um, when we redesign this new system, uh, and I believe it's a when rather than an if, um, I believe that we can co-construct a, a massively improved model um, that, that, that should and will improve uh, and, and get to a better choice for our families. Um, we want to move away from the idea that, that inclusion is situational, that it's about whether you're in a special school or in the mainstream school, to the, the idea that you put the child at the centre of the offer, and actually it doesn't really matter where, where that young person is educated. It can be in a series of and in different places, but the key element is it's about high quality impact at the end, which is the bit that I mentioned earlier about moving to um, this idea that we've got to understand exactly what our aim is for, for, the, for, the, for the young people and their offer. Um, that's um, a, a when, not an if, but it's a huge when. It's a, an enormous piece of work to actually um, ensure that we can influence key, key drivers within, within all of the sectors to, to get to the position that we need to be at. And then the last, the last question really was about um, young people with autism, advice on training and development needs of staff. I think we have to be really careful, colleagues, that, 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 that we don't label youngsters in, in a way that we have done in the past. We, we are seeing and we're experiencing young people that are coming into our schools who, who, are, who are coming with, with, with needs that we've never seen before that we need to understand. So I, I, I don't think that we can neatly say that, that there's going to be this training package up there, there's going to be this, 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 this seminar here that will suddenly unlock the challenges that we face. This has to be every single colleague, a, a, a learning person who is able to understand uh, and better, better deal with um, 
youngsters who come through our doors, whether they, they're on a continuum or they have profound and multiple learning difficulties. So it's about every colleague be, 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 being an educator of young people with additional needs. So um, that's the, the, I think I'm 30 seconds over, Toby, so I do apologise for that. If people do want to get in contact with us, share, share some of our ambition on our journey, uh, my email's around the place, uh, please feel free to, free to reach out. That was a great speed date. I'll go out with you, Graham, it's fine. Um, so, no, I mean, genuinely, thank you very much for that, and, and a lot squeezed into a small space, uh, and I agree with what you said and I agree with your focus on the breadth and understanding the increased complexity um, and our obsession with labelling. Uh, so Lucy, Hello. You three hard acts to follow. Over I to have. You. Do you know, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so I've introduced myself already, but for those of you who don't know about Hatish Chat, we are a professional network for school leaders. And we're dedicated to looking after uh, those who work in school. So you may not be a school leader, but you might be a teaching assistant, you might be a governor, um, but we, we offer information, support and resources. And um, we set up like seven years ago because we wanted to know answers to lots of questions. And we discovered that everybody else wanted to know the same answers to the same questions. So that's why we set up. And um, going on from what Graham was saying in terms of um, you know, not labelling children and, and being really uh, an advocate for the child, really. Um, before, when I, when I set her teacher chat up, um, I worked with Alison Peacock and we did an awful lot of work about uh, not labelling children and taking the lid off their learning and, and things like that to the point where I managed to turn a school round from, with the support of my team around me, obviously, from special measures to a good school within 10 months just because we did exactly that, Graham. We took the lid off the children's learning. We didn't label them as being an, a, a certain type. And we said, right, you know, we're going to give you a challenge and you choose which challenge you do and how you learn. And, and honestly, that was probably the best run up to me being a Senko that I've ever could have had. Because I think once you start to look at all children as different learners, what I'm about to say today can, can be a, a, you know approached to every child in every school, but it is about being an advocate for the child individually. So could I have my next slide, please, Zara? Thank you. So I've been asked to talk about what makes a really good teaching assistant for those who work with children with autism. But again, well, this could be any member of staff, not necessarily a teaching assistant, but any child. And I'm going to be talking about really obvious things because actually, I think sometimes we spend too long thinking, oh, well, in the future we'll have this and in the future we'll have this. But right now you are in a school with a situation unfolding and you need some help and advice. So this is your help and advice. The first one is really important. It's about knowing the child. So lots of people say, oh, you know, I've tried this, I've tried that, I've tried this, but actually, do you really know the child? When was the last time you sat down and you talked to them about how they like to learn, what they like to learn and those sorts of things? You'll be amazed at how many people don't spend that time doing that important work. And if you can do that, the rest of it is easy. Uh, the second point is understanding autism and how you can help because, um, you know, obviously if you have a child with autism, in your school or in your class and you don't understand autism then obviously you need to go and find out what that is and how you can help working as a team is really important so you know if you have an agreed script for example and one member of staff is following that agreed script and another member of staff isn't then that can cause uh, stress and anxiety for everyone involved so you know it's really important you work as a team have a plan that is unique to the child. And not all children with autism are the same. It goes back to what I was saying before. You know, every child is a different learner, end of. So, you know, have a child, have a plan that is completely unique to that child. Environment is so important. So if you're in a classroom and the child is unhappy in that environment, then you need to change it. And you need to change it now. 
we had a child for a long, long time who didn't like the texture of the carpet. We didn't know that. So every time we sat on the carpet, they would, they would get stressed. So I had to talk to the child, goes back to know the child. Tell us about your classroom. What do you like? What don't you like? Tell us about your learning. What do you like? What don't you like? Be flexible. So, um, you know, it goes back to having that plan. If your plan isn't working, then have a go at being flexible and changing it. And this one, number seven, I absolutely love working with all children, no matter what their ability and their additional need. But having a child who goes from A to B with you and watching that learning process is magical. So enjoy it, be part of that. Celebrate every success, no matter how small, and understand that all behavior is communication. But importantly, when you're a teaching assistant or a member of staff, whatever your role, working with any child with an additional need, you do need to take the time for yourself too, because sometimes it can be quite hard work. So as a school leader, what are my top tips for making a school really continuum friendly? And I suppose it goes back to the assess, plan, do, review stage, except I like to call it assess, plan, take action quickly and review. So assess the child. Now there's a whole, I could go on forever about assessing the child. There are so many, so many ways to know that child. You could do, you could give them a test, you could ask some questions, you know, but think about what is right and relevant for that child. You know, giving them a key stage two SATs paper, if they're not working at key stage two SATs, is that fair on the child or the parents? Or the members of staff around that child. So really consider, you know, what you're going to give that child and how you're going to approach it. Um, use that knowledge to inform what you need to know about planning so that when you go to teaching, into teaching, you can then develop, uh, deliver something which is relevant to them. When you're planning what to do, so go back to plan, when you're planning what to do with the child, plan together because actually you're a team and you work around that child together. So if you're a school leader or a teacher or a teaching assistant, make sure you have regular conversations together. This is what we're going to do here. This is what we're going to do next. And this is what we'll do if this happens. So planning together is really important, but you must plan. You must have some sort of idea of, of how to um, support that child with their learning. So take action. <laughs> this one I can't stress enough. You know, some people go, oh yes, we've got this plan in place and, and um, we spent all week doing the plan. And then um, three months later, the plan isn't even started and the child is getting more and more anxious and stressed. Doesn't matter what need they have, doesn't matter who the child is, if you've written a plan and you haven't taken action quickly, then you're letting that child and that family down. So please take action quickly in a timely manner. Make sure you communicate it effectively around you, with those around you, because, you know, people need to know what the plan is. Um, review. OK, so be brave. If something you've decided you want to do isn't working, then perhaps change it. Again, it goes back to being timely. Change it quickly. It's really hard because you have to balance what is working well and be, with being consistent and changing that things that aren't working well. So be kind of considerate of that. So children do like to have consistency. So you can't keep just changing everything. And then my last top tip is to keep things simple. I can't stress this enough. You know, sometimes we try too hard for children. And actually, we overcomplicate things by putting so many layers of stuff in, in, in place. Actually, clear the decks, start from the beginning, know the child, talk to the child, talk to the family, find out what you need to do, and then do it. You know, and I, you know, the, hopefully, with all of our help and effort, we'll make a big difference to children's lives. Thank you.
Lucy, thank you. And thank you to all the panellists. Um, still put your questions. If you're online, please still put your questions in. I know that some put them in and then they've been answered. I also think that because of the way the panellists have addressed the issues, some of the inherent questions have been answered as you've gone along. Um, but I've got a couple to ask. And I'm going to ask you each now my obvious bonus one, that second question there. If you were Secretary of State, what would you have put in your green paper? So you, you know that's there. So I'm going to go, first of all, Graham, what would you put in? Um, I, 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 find, I find the question very challenging, Toby, for a number of reasons. I don't, I'm not convinced I, I, I would necessarily be the Secretary of State for, for a number of reasons. Probably um, one of the main ones being I'm, I'm, I'm an Oiki outspoken northerner. Um, but but um, I, I, one, of the, one of the areas that, that um, I, I would really welcome would the opportunity to, to, to join services up more under a universal provider. Um, at times, and I think the Green Paper has started to, to explore these sorts of issues, but, but I noticed one of the questions, I think it was from one of the anonymous attendees, was related to, to um, assessments and the timeliness of assessments, et cetera. One, one of the challenges that many of my schools face um, is, is understanding the complexity of the young people that come, to, come through our doors at this point in time. And it feels that the system is still a little too um, uh, isolated, that, that we, we all tend to work in, in silos and, and, and trying to pull together um, uh, all of those different departments under um, a more universal offer would be my ambition. Uh, and I will give you an exact example of that at the minute. We are struggling at the minute with, with young people um, post-COVID uh, who are labelled as having social, emotional, mental health developments, particularly key stage four, particularly boys from East Manchester. They're not coming anymore. Um, understanding why they're not coming is incredibly complicated, bearing in mind they've been at home for, for 18 months and, and really haven't engaged with us massively. A lot of it's been doorstep engagement, etc. To actually um, get those youngsters back into school, into a learning environment, isn't just about educationalists doing what they need to do and providing the very best curriculum offer. It's about support workers, family workers, family support workers, et cetera, et cetera, social workers, really trying to get to grips with the family dynamic and what's happening within that community. So at the minute, that, that it feels that we're outsourcing it to third party and, and they are under-resourced, to me, if I was Secretary of State, I would be trying to pull all of those elements together so that the universal provider controlled that and there was a key point of action. All right, and others have tried, but I don't disagree. Um, thank you. And I think there's a place for a gobby norther as Secretary of State, but that's just levelling up, isn't it? Alison? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, I think I agree with Graham. I'd like to go, I'd like to take this question in two parts, really, and think, send an AP green paper, one part, parking that for a minute, but thinking more broadly about education policy. I think what I'd really like is for us to be looking, reviewing at the purpose and structure of education, particularly mainstream education more generally and broadly, and looking at the terrible outcomes we've currently got for children with all sorts of different needs, um, and thinking about how we can have healthier, happier, mentally well children looking maybe to other countries where education systems are different um, and we don't have that high stakes um, exam culture that can cause so many difficulties when it comes to personalised education. So that's sort of aside, I guess, from the, the SEND green paper. Uh, but within that, I think pulling together a lot of what colleagues have said here, I think it feels like there's a synergy here. It feels like people are in a space where we want to move away from labels. We want to move away from, we want a paradigm shift where we don't have to consider the difficulties there can be for all educators in understanding the nuances and the differences between all of the con conditions that have labels attached to them. We understand there's a space for that. We understand there's a role for that, but there's also something for me about being able to move beyond that to sort of take that trans diagnostic lens and think about actually how do we 
redesign education in the classroom so that it is more universally designed for learning that all children can participate in, much as Lucy's described in that sequence of you know, how to work with an individual so that we can offer the choice so that we can set up learning differently. So it would be trying to find a brave way really to allow professionals to take those informed risks of being able to change the way it, their classrooms operate so that it's optimised for all children all the time. And we don't have the kind of additional to different from, which is what we've got with SCN at the moment, which layers on top and which can feel like it's a, a huge ask of, of, of the teaching profession to understand everything. Thank you. Tracy, because someone's asked a question as well, you're going to tell me about the Secretary of State, but at the same time answer that question about the place of non-maintained independent schools uh, as part of local provision. Um, and I was very struck by your first responder and someone else that, that sort of mentioned that. Um, is there a place for non-maintained to be more supportive and more integrated into that local provision? So in a clever nuance, see if you can briefly try and be Secretary of State and answer one of the questions. Um, well, it goes without saying that what's already been said, why wouldn't, why wouldn't I agree with that? Um, I, I think um, what I would want to see, what I would perhaps put more of is more explicitly something around, what, what we all face at the moment is a whole raft of different methodology um, that people are trying to apply to underpin pedagogy um, to get to outcomes for children. And uh, there's there's nothing explicit in, in, in the review around, you know, the kind of how people get to work together. If you've got these kind of methodology, kind of different principles or whatever, um, then it already stunts the dialogue that could go on. And I say dialogue rather than debate, because I don't, I don't like the idea that what, you know, something's right and something's wrong, that there needs to be more dialogue about what works, what doesn't work and, 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 and so on. And remembering coming back to the point at the end is that what works for one child might not work for another. So, um, and what works for one family doesn't work for another. So that, that that's, um, I don't think it, interestingly, it doesn't really um, go into enough of the individual. And that's the problem with the whole of our education system, but I, I, I won't um, go there. Um, so the non-maintained and independent um, uh, as part of the provision, I, it, it relies on, currently it relies on the relationships that we hold with individual people in the local authorities. Um, and it, what we all know, of course, is local authorities have a great churn in um, people in different positions. And that makes it very difficult to build a, um, a, a solid relationship. That means that you, you can be seen as part of the continuum of provision. And, and have those discussions around, well, what, because a lot of the time non-maintained and independent tend to fill a gap. They, they plug a, an issue in an area or, a, or a, a, you know, a perceived need or an actual need um, that's not being met by the sort of local authority or general provision. And what would be great, wouldn't it, is if that was seen as a positive rather than a negative. And it becomes negative because independent and non-maintained have to um, highlight their true costs, whereas local authority don't do that. So um, we've got to get over that barrier of, of money. Um, and if we're in a dialogue and we attach the outcomes of children to what we're talking about, then surely we should all be in the continuum of provision. Um, and there may be times when, you know, some people would say in an ideal world you wouldn't need independent special because all the needs are being met within our education system and, and, and wouldn't that be great um so long as within that we are meeting individual needs and 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 that's i, I think that's the rub i'm not i haven't actually looked at the actual questions so i've probably just waffled on about anything i fancy sorry about that toby <laughs> no, you did lucy <laughs> lucy uh, you've got two minutes, less time than Graham had on his date, um, to tell me what you'd do as Secretary of State. I was trying to talk quickly before, but I think this is going to be impossible. Um, how, well, how would I fit all of that in in like a minute and a bit? 
I would say number one the key word is funding 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 and support for schools hugely and families I see I told you I could go on and on and on I think you know schools do a fantastic job um, and often we are the first responders if you like to any issues that come up and I think if we had more funding um, more time more energy more capacity the difference would be huge so yeah definitely funding and support brilliant thank you Zara if we move on to the that's the one um because I don't want to miss this opportunity it fits in very nicely to what Lucy said about funding um so Zen I support Zen and I choose to support Zen uh, for the only reason that they're an ethical alternative to other agencies here comes the sales pitch and thank you for nodding Graham um, but you know they have saved schools over five million since they were set up they're a social enterprise they want to make a difference the staff that work for them get a fairer wage than they would with lots of other agencies uh, so it's a win-win and because you've either listened or joined this seminar here is a 50% off on your first day of covered it tells you there on that slide how to claim that um, so it's no strings attached try them uh, because actually it is about funding but it is also about the specialist and skills support and that is a variety of different professionals all of us who've worked and i've worked in every form of specialist provision both within mainstream and specialist and pru's and actually it's the combination the team of staff around the child that makes the difference that might be teaching assistants, special school assistant, whatever you call them. The paraprofessionals and the teachers are the ones that make the difference. And that's Zen's bread and butter. That's what Zen does, and they do it very well. So that's the sales pitch over. I now want to thank very much and sincerely the panel. Thank you very much for giving up your time. I want to thank Zara for pulling it together and being so efficient. Uh, she's typical of Zen, uh, very tech savvy, very hardworking nice people that work really hard to try and do the best for those that they serve um, and i want to thank all of you for joining us because if you've got any other questions afterwards send them in but each of these speakers has also been generous enough to give you their contact details or their um, uh, details of their organization and of course you can also message and spread the message on this webinar and this seminar on Twitter at Zen Educate. Please do that because it all helps to get the message out. And do look at the green paper and we will send out that very abridged version of it. It's very simple and accessible version. So you can actually see what there is in the green paper so you can respond. So Graham, thank you. Tracy, thank you. Alison, thank you. And Lucy, thank you. And thank you to all of you who dialed in today. Um, and I hopefully we'll see some of you again soon. And Zara, thank you. And that's the end of our seminar today. Thank you very much.